Welcome back, everyone, to Ramakatha Rasa Vahini from Satya Sai Baba. This is Chapter 3, and we get our first glimpse of Ravana here in Chapter 3. So, Chapter 3, No Progeny from His Loins. Ravana, the Rakshasa king of Lanka, heard of Dasharatha and his fame. He was so filled with envy that he determined on a sure plan to destroy him, by means fair or foul. Ravana sought for an excuse to provoke Dasharatha into a fight. One day, he sent word through a messenger that unless tribute was paid to him, he would have to meet Ravana on the battlefield and demonstrate his superior might in war. This call was against international morality, but what morality did a Rakshasa respect? When Dasharatha heard the messenger speak, he laughed outright in derision. Even while the messenger was looking on, he shot sharp, deadly arrows which reached Lanka itself and fastened the gates of that city. Addressing the envoys, Dasharatha said, Well, sirs, I have now made fast the doors of your fortress city. Your master cannot open them, however hard he may try. That is the tribute I pay to your impertinent lord. When the envoys returned and informed Ravana of this, he was shocked to find all the doors closed fast. The desperate efforts made by Ravana with all his men met with failure. They could not open the gate. When Ravana was struck with shame, strangely enough, the arrows returned to Ayodhya and the doors flew open. Ravana, however, decided that he must overpower all the rulers of the world, and realizing that he could do so only by winning divine grace, he went over to the depths of the forest and selected a favorable, auspicious spot for his ascetic practices. The asceticism of Ravana was so intense and satisfying that God Brahma was compelled to appear before him and offer to grant him whatever boon he desired. Ravana, ask for anything you want. I shall give you your heart's desire, said Brahma. Ravana was revolving in his mind the insult he had suffered at the hands of Dasharatha. He argued that Dasharatha might get even mightier sons from whom he might suffer more. So he asked the boon he wanted, quote, Lord, bless me with this gift of grace. Let no child be born from the loins of Dasharatha. At this Brahma said, So be it, and immediately vanished from the scene, lest Ravana might frame another foul request. request. If he were present before him, Ravana strutted about proud and devoid of fear, exulting over his prowess and success. Meanwhile, another project entered his head. Dasharatha is a youth of marital age now. If I so contrive that he does not marry at all, it will make my safety doubly sure, he thought within himself. Looking about with the aid of his Rakshasa skills, he discerned that there was a great likelihood that Dasharatha will wed the daughter of the king of Kosala. So he decided to put an end to that princess. When one's own destruction is imminent, reason turns crooked, as the saying goes. He entered the Kosala kingdom, stealthily in disguise, and kidnapped the princess. Placing her in a wooden box, he cast it over the waves of the sea. Ravana could not see the truth that nothing can ever happen without the concurrence of the divine will. Brahma willed otherwise. The box was carried by the waves onto the shore. The place where it landed was a fine recreation area. The next day, Sumantra, the prime minister of Dasharatha, happened to visit the place on a quiet holiday to be spent in discussing within himself the problems of state. His eyes fell in the box. He retrieved it and opened it. He was surprised to find in it a charming girl with attractive shining eyes and a halo of divine splendor. Sumantra was overcome with pity. He spoke soft and sweet to the girl. Little one, how did it happen that you were placed inside this box? She replied, Sir, I am the princess of the Kosala kingdom. My name is Kosalya. I am not aware how I came inside this box nor who placed me in it. I was playing with my companions in the palace gardens. I do not remember what happened to me. Sumantra was moved by her simple and sincere statement. He said, Such barbarian stratagems are resorted to only by rakshasas. They are beyond the ken of men. I shall take you to your father, 
and place you in his hand. Come with me. Let us go without delay. Sumantra placed her in his chariot and proceeded to Kasala, where he restored her to the king and recited before the court the details known to him. The king, too, interrogated Sumantra in various ways. He discovered that he was none other than the minister of the court of Dasharatha, emperor of Ayodhya, and that his master was still unmarried. He was filled with joy at the discovery. He said, Minister, you brought back to me this child of mine, saving her from destruction. So I have resolved to give her in marriage to your master himself. Please inform the king of my offer. He honored Sumatra with due ceremony and sent him with the court priest an appropriate presence. Sumatra told Dasarata in detail all that had happened. In order to confirm his acceptance, Dasharatha sent with the court priest of Kasala his own court priest with gifts of auspicious nature. The date and time were fixed. Dasharatha proceeded to the Kasala capital, accompanied by a magnificent array of elephantry, chariotry, cavalry, and infantry. The paean of music which marched with him reached the sky and echoed from the horizon. The marriage of Dasharatha and Kasalya was celebrated with resounding grandeur and splendor. The king of Kasala took Sumantra near him and said, You are the person who brought about this glory. Of course, nothing ever happens without God's will. Nevertheless, how can I repay the debt? I owe you and demonstrate my gratitude to you. Please honor my offer and accept it. Be wedded this day itself in my capital city. If you agree, I shall arrange for the celebration of that joyous event this very day. Dasharatha and Sumantra gave their consent to the proposal. Sumantra was married to the daughter of Viradasa of the clan of Ganga. The news of the marriage of both king and prime minister at the same place on the same day spread throughout the city, nay, throughout the kingdom. The land was filled with wonder and delight. The festival lasted three days. The populace were treated to music, drama, dance, and other forms of entertainment. Night and day were packed with excitement and joy. On the fourth day, Dasharatha started back for Ayodhya with his queen and courtiers, as well as Minister Sumantra, with his bride and entourage. They entered the city amidst the acclamation of the people. His subjects exulted at the marriage of both king and minister. They danced in the streets and shouted, Jay, Jay, till their throats got hoarse. They lined the streets to see their queen. They sprinkled rose water on the roads by which they came and welcomed them, waving flames of camphor. Dasharatha resumed his royal duties and ruled the realm with love and care. Often he went with his consort on excursions into the forests and spent his days happily. But as time sped through days, months, and even years, the shadows of distress darkened the face of the king, for the pang of being childless saddened him. The king consulted priests, pundits, and ministers, and when he knew that their desire confirmed the earnest prayer of Kasalya, he married another wife, Sumitra. Sumitra lived up to her name, for she was indeed full of companionable virtues. Kosalya and Sumitra were bound to each other by ties of affection, far stronger than those between a mother and child. Each yearned to give joy to the other. Each had deep fortitude, detachment, and sympathy. But in spite of the lapse of many years, no signs of the king securing a successor to the throne were evident. Moved by despair, the king married a third wife at the instance of the two queens. She was Kaika, the exquisitely charming daughter of the king of Kekaya in Kashmir. The king of Kekaya, however, laid down certain conditions. Before agreeing to give his daughter away in marriage, he insisted that the son born of Kaika should have the right of accession to the throne. If the king of Ayodhya could not agree to this, he declared, he would not consent. Garga, the court priest, brought back the message to Ayodhya. Kasalya and Sumitra recognized the ardor of the king to wed the princess of Kekaya, whose beauty was being extolled highly by all. They felt that the duty of a true wife is to obey the least wish of the husband and do her best to help the realization of that wish. They also knew full well that the imperial line of Ayodhya can never be polluted by a son who would transgress Dharma. Though Dasharatha might promise that the son of the third wife could succeed to the throne, the son of Kaika, born in the dynasty, would certainly be an embodiment of righteousness, free from such blemish. So they pleaded with him, 
with palms meeting in prayer, Lord, what greater happiness have we than yours? Accept the conditions laid by the king of Kikaya and wed his daughter and ensure the continuity of this dynasty of Ragu. There is no need to spend even a minute's thought upon this. The words of the queens fanned his native ardor to even brighter flame. Therefore, the king sent Garga back with many presents, agreeing to the terms and informing the king that he was following fast for the wedding ceremony. The ceremony itself was celebrated with lavish magnificence. Dasharata returned to his capital, shining like the moon amidst the stars. When he passed through the streets in procession, accompanied by the three queens, the king treated each of them with equal consideration. They, too, evinced equal love and respect towards each other and the king. They adored him and were afraid to displease him. They endeavored their best to carry out his wishes and not to hinder his desire, for they revered him as their god in the tradition of the true wife. They lived with such intimate mutual love that it appeared as if all three had but one breath, though they moved about as three bodies. Years passed. The king and the queens crossed the bounds of youth and middle age and approached the realm of old age. There were no signs of the sun. Therefore, though the women's apartments of the palace had all the comforts and accessories needed for happy existence, the hearts of the queens were torn by unrest, anxiety, and despair. One evening, the four, the king and his queens, sat in a room or the palace, spending hours of anxiety over the future of Ayoja and the, pros the prospects of its prosperity and safety, and each attempted to answer intelligently and pleasantly. At last, unable to resolve the problem, they rose, heavily dejected, and decided that they should consult the family preceptor, Vasishta, and accept his advice. At break of dawn, Vasishta was respectfully invited to grant his presence. Many pundits and counselors were also called for consultation. The king placed before them the problem of finding a successor to rule the vast realm between the two seas, the imperial domain under the sway of the Ragu dynasty. Overcome by despair, Dasharata prayed to the elders in plaintive terms for beneficial suggestions. Vasishta dwelt long in thought. At last he opened his eyes and spoke thus, King, you need not grieve thus. Ayoja will not be rendered masterless. She will not suffer widowhood. This domain will be gay, happy, and prosperous, in unbroken festivity and evergreen with festoonery. She will be the guardian of right living, reverberating with music and joy. I will not agree to the raising of a prince from some other dynasty to the throne of Ayoja. The grace of God is a gift inscrutable. The vow of righteousness which you are fulfilling will surely bring you the supreme joy of having a son. Do not delay any further. Invite the sage Rishyas, Nurga, Rishyas Ringa, the son of Vivandaka, and perform with him as the high priest the sacred yaga sacrifice called Putra Kameshti, the yaga prescribed for those desirous of begetting a son. Make all the necessary ceremonial and ritual arrangements for the yaga forthwith. Your desire will be achieved without fail. The queens listened to these reassuring words spoken so emphatically by Vasishta. They were filled with Ananda. The bud of hope bloomed anew in their hearts. They retired into their apartments, praying most earnestly. The king searched among his entourage for the most appropriate emissary to be sent to Rishyasringa, son of Vibandaka, and to invite him to the imperial capital on such a mission. At last he called near him his old friend Romapada, the king of the Anga state, and sent him with necessary instructions and equipment. Meanwhile, arrangements for the Yaga were put through on the bank of the sacred Sarayu River. Attractive sacrificial altars were constructed in conformity with sacred injunctions. The city was decorated with flags and festoons. As was anticipated, the great sage, Rishasringa, entered the city of Ayodhya to the great delight of all with his consort, Santa. Emperor Dasharatha welcomed the sage as at the main gate of the palace. He ceremonially washed the feet of the distinguished saint. He placed on his own head a few drops of the water sanctified by his feet. He then fell at the feet of Vasishta and prayed to him to inquire from Rishasringa 
the proper procedure for the contemplated yaga. Rishasringa wanted that the ministers and scholars be seated in appointed order. He directed the king also to sit on his throne. Then he described the various processes of the ceremony so that the court priests could note them for their guidance. He gave them in such detail that everyone even knew where exactly he was to sit in the sacrificial hall. The sage decided that the yaga shall begin on the stroke of seven the very next day. The news spread all over the city in a trice. Before dawn, every street was decorated with green festoons. Every road was packed with people pressing forward to the vast open space on the bank of the Sarayu, where the yaga was to be performed. The river bank was thick with the eager populace. Rishasringa, with his consort Santa, entered the specially built yaga mantap, mantap with the king and queens, while Vedic chanting and the music of bugle, trumpet, and clarinet, and the cheers of the people resounded from the sky. Rishasringa was installed as the Brahma, or chief organizer for the Yaga. He assigned various tasks like worship, recitation, chanting, propitiation, etc., to scholars in consideration of their qualifications. The offerings were placed in the sacred fire with the prescribed formulae by Rishasringa himself with scrupulous exactitude, deep devotion, and faith. From the fire that was scripturally fed, there arose before all eyes a divine person who shone with the blinding splendor of a sudden stroke of lightning. He held a bright vessel in his hand. At this, the vast concourse, including the priests, were petrified with wonder, awe, fear, and joy. They were overwhelmed by the sudden onrush of bliss, bliss and mystery. The king and queen shed tears of joy. They cast their looks upon the divine person and prayed to him with folded palms. Rishasringa continued the formulae with undisturbed equanimity, as the text prescribed, offering oblations in the fire. Suddenly, a voice as on the day of emergence resounded from the dome of the sky. Rishasringa sat aghast and sought to listen to the message from above. Maharaja, accept this vessel and give the sacred payasam, food brought therein, in appropriate shares to your three queens, the voice announced, placing the vessel in the hands of the king, the mysterious person who had emerged from the flames disappeared into them. The joy of the people, princes, pundits, and priests who witnessed this great manifestation knew no bounds. Soon, the final rituals were completed, and the Maharaja returned in procession to the palace with the sacred vessel gifted by the gods in his hands. And here ends chapter 3 of the Ramakatha Rasavahini, uh, a.k.a. Ramayana, given by Sri Satya Sai Baba. Sai Ram.